The PubSub pattern allows a developer to create channels, and messages can be written to and read from those channels. PubSub messaging is useful for multicast messaging when you want to publish messages from a producer and have multiple consumers who are subscribed to the publisher receive those messages. Almost any application that reaches a high level of complexity will need a PubSub system of some kind. And even simple systems like chat applications are made much easier by a PubSub component. A PubSub system itself can be complex. A PubSub system needs to scale up and down to handle different numbers of consumers and producers in different volumes of messages. Back in 2010, the growth of mobile and cloud was leading to many new applications with high-throughput, multi-user interactions. Developers were standing up their own instances of open-source PubSub message queuing systems like RabbitMQ and ZeroMQ. Once the MQ systems needed to scale, the developer would need to handle the scaling themselves. Stephen Blum started his company PubNub around this time to create automatically scaling APIs for messaging. Stephen joins the show to discuss the infrastructure choices around building a large-scale PubSub service and how the company has scaled over time. He also talks about the management, product development, and business side of running the company. PubNub has built several additional technologies on top of the core infrastructure that was originally built for PubSub messaging. Full disclosure, PubNub is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. LiveRamp is one of the fastest growing companies in data connectivity in the Bay Area, and they're looking for senior level talent to join their team. LiveRamp helps the world's largest brands activate their data to improve customer interactions on any channel or device. The infrastructure is at a tremendous scale. A 500 billion node identity graph generated from over a thousand data sources running a 85 petabyte Hadoop cluster and application servers that process over 20 billion HTTP requests per day. The LiveRamp team thrives on mind-bending technical challenges. LiveRamp members value entrepreneurship, humility, and constant personal growth. If this sounds like a fit for you, check out softwareengineeringdaily.com slash LiveRamp. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash LiveRamp. Thanks to LiveRamp for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Stephen Blum is the founder and CTO of PubNub. Stephen, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hey, thank you for having me today. Yeah, it's great to have you. You <laughs> founded PubNub, which is a play off of the term PubSub. And <laughs> the PubSub pattern has been around in software engineering for a pretty long time. Explain what the PubSub pattern is. Yeah, uh, great question. It's funny that you even asked that in the first place, talking about PubNub being playing the word PubSub. Specifically, we did that for marketing reasons. If you search for PubNub, you're only going to find PubNub. If you search for PubSub, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. And publish, subscribe is that paradigm where you have a centralized topic or conversation, sort of like a chat room. You can say, I want to subscribe to this chat room. And anything that happens in that chat room, I want to be notified immediately. And you can publish information to that chat room and everyone subscribe to that chat room will get that updates like IRC, Slack, you're familiar with those types of uh, applications that use publish subscribe. Although it's not just useful for chat systems, this is something that's widely used for, I mean, it's used for all kinds of applications, like generally when you scale, and you have types of systems where you have multiple consumers off of a single producer, for example, and you need to do kind of specific casting where you're not, you know, maybe you're not multicasting to every single channel that's out there that people could potentially listen to, but you want to hit a specific subset of applications that are listening, you know, the PubSub pattern is, is quite useful for that. So when you started PubNub, there were a few ways of doing PubSub. There's like ZeroMQ and RabbitMQ and Redis. And right. What were the problems with the ways that people were implementing the PubSub pattern? Good question. In terms of the problems, there, the implementation they used is fine. I mean, what their approach was having servers communicate with each other, usually to do message brokering. You mentioned RabbitMQ. You've got a ton of other ones like JMS, and you've got brokerless design patterns that, such as ZeroMQ. Those are server-to-server -server communication. 
when you want to extend that beyond your data center and to you know that phone that's in your pocket the design pattern needs to change it needs to be a little bit different those connections are not guaranteed like they mostly are inside of a data center you're going to have different ip addresses throughout the day you're traveling you get the train ip you get you know going 4g you switch to wi-fi you need a system that's able to sort of store and forward and follow that device as it changes its location in order to allow it to receive messages reliably could you maybe like contrast an implementation of pubs like i think this was back in in 2010 although to you know to some degree it's probably still true today if you wanted to use kafka or back then if you wanted to use zero mq these lower level uh, pub sub abstractions how would that differ from using what you've built? Those systems are potential components within an orchestratable engineering system that we built with PubNub. Kind of difficult to describe. Essentially, if you were to use a Kafka or RabbitMQ in your backend to facilitate at that store and forward mechanisms for devices outside your firewall, say you wanted to create a publish subscribe for mobile phone apps, you would start with like say a Socket.io or some sort of interface that allows you to gain access to that message broker Uh, The challenge is once you start getting a lot of subscribers and how do you federate or distribute the workload across many systems? And we found the best way to do that was to write our own software. And we did this. We wrote it and all of PubNub is completely written in C. It allows us to control the memory, the connection patterns, the retry, the store and forward, our caching mechanisms, the GC. It's a system that in order to scale to hundreds of millions of connected devices and have as many topics as you want, we had to build ourselves. Uh, You look at Kafka, for example, fantastic system. Everyone loves it. talking about it. You have to tune that system to specific use cases. How big is the message payload size going to be? How many topics are you going to have? How long is the data supposed to live on? On disk. If you have a specific use case, you can use Kafka and build on your own infrastructure. However, once that use case starts changing, you're going to need to spin up a separate cluster specifically for that. And that's why we built our own because we wanted to sell it to anyone who wanted to use it with a simple publish subscribe API call. That means it's a multi-tenant environment and everyone has different use cases. You mentioned earlier on here, hey, it's not just chat. It's IoT devices. It's uh, hailing taxi cabs. It's making phones ring. It's a ton of different use cases, and they all have different load profiles on the network. Do you think it's an apt comparison to something like Heroku, like a product like Heroku, where they took what AWS was doing, and I think they did it in, in around around the same time that, that you got started, but it was kind of this model where, okay, we've got, there are companies that are starting to offer pretty good infrastructure solutions to developers, but there is this other tier of developers that doesn't want to use the low-level, difficult-to-use solution. So, you know, like what Heroku did, you know, they took EC2 instances and made them easier to use. Basically, they built APIs (laughs) on them that were simpler to use, and they took care of a lot of the failure cases, and they just made it easier to run your infrastructure. And I think it's kind of seems similar where you looked at this and you said, okay, PubSub is a very common use case, and it's actually pretty hard to implement, even if you have these abstractions like the MQs or the Redis or the Kafka. You really want kind of a full-fledged series of abstractions on top of that that just abstracts away everything that you don't want to think about. Yeah, you nailed it. That's the most important part is the simplicity of implementation. You you don't want to focus on building infrastructure as you're uh, focusing on your specific app. For example, if you're Lyft and you just want to connect drivers and passengers to each other, you really don't want to have to orchestrate an entire federated Kafka cluster that you'd much rather just build the application, make it better, make it faster. You're, You're competing with Uber. You don't have time to focus on building this messaging infrastructure, and especially nothing like it exists that's an open source. So you're going to want to choose an existing vendor that can just make it really simple for you. Yeah. So this was you started this around 2010. What were the kinds of applications that people were building on it in the early days, and how have those changed over time? Oh, I was uh, games, gaming. Hmm. That's even what got me into programming in the first place. It's like, what? Look at these amazing things you can do with the computer. Make the pixels pretty, shining, whizzing, like particle effects, and just the essence of games and how 
you know, they teach you things or their social interactions. Our first customers were multiplayer games on phones and mo- like early phones. Cause it, I, back then it was just iPhone one, iPhone two, you know, type day. Uh, Android was barely getting started a lot of web games. And so we, that's when we got started. We started making a lot of money back then on games. We see chat starting to evolve. In fact, about 60% of our current revenues coming from chat and a, a lot of the existing customer infrastructure that you've used that's probably on your phone right now is being powered by PubNub and you didn't even know it. Fascinating. Yeah, regarding the games use case, we had this show recently about scalable multiplayer games and the challenges of building multiplayer games that work internationally and especially on on mobile devices where you get network partitions all the time and your you know your wi-fi you know chops out it can be really (laughs) difficult to to figure out all the retry cases especially because it's like it is a real-time experience and like it's too bad when a skype connection drops out because skype is you know kind of a real-time thing as well but in a game you might just lose like you know you you chops out and there's no there's no recovering from the network partition there so i can imagine people wanting to to have some you know easier times building games with uh you know assisted by some infrastructure yeah, you nailed it. That's just that's such an important part of that user experience. You want, in addition to you know implementing that multiplayer stack into your app, you want your end users to have a fantastic experience. That's really the end of the day. I mean, for us, our customers are our developers and our customers' customers are those gamers. They're, they're playing that game. And if they drop out and lose, that's they're going to have that bad feeling. And the important part is not, what do people remember? They don't really remember what you tell them. They remember how you make them feel. And so if you lose a game due to network connectivity, I mean, of course, you're probably used to it on a mobile phone. But if you're just sitting there on your home Wi-Fi and it goes out and you know the Internet's working, you're going to blame the game. And you're just going to have a bad feeling about that. It's uh, got to make sure that that experience is happy and joyful, especially at the beginning. Mm. So you mentioned that the early product was built in C and I'd love to know the rest of the early product infrastructure and then we can get into how it's evolved over time. So it's you basically built a pub sub engine in C. Mm-hmm. Just give some more details on what that looked like, how it was deployed, how long it took you to build that initial version. So let's see, it's still C today. So our infrastructure is uh, different than you would hear from pretty much any other infrastructure. We're globally distributed, which means that we've had to create a full mesh of C processes that are living in all the data centers that we deploy them to. And they all connect to each other in some way or another. Essentially, when you send a message through PubNub using the Publish API, that message is replicated three times per data center. And we copy that data. Every single data center gets a copy. And that allows us to have end users connecting across nations, across countries to the closest data center. And then using interconnects between data centers, we're able to transmit those messages quickly, much faster than you'd get if it was a peer-to-peer situation uh, and much more reliably as well. And that's what makes PubNub different. We're kind of like a CDN, a content delivery network. Uh, You always connect to that closest data center. And that was our vision from the beginning. We always wanted to have that. In fact, we have patents around that specific model for delivery of service. And it's fantastic. In, In addition, we have a specific engineering philosophy. This one is around not like a backup system. We don't want to have cold systems in standby that are ready to just pop up when other systems go down because, hey, you know what? Systems fail all the time. Hardware fails, connection fails. What we want to do is have a system that's always running and every server is always servicing traffic and we expect those nodes to fail. We've built a system that allows that failure to occur and messages will get automatically routed around the failure. We make phones ring and that's really important for customers, our customers, because every second that that phone doesn't ring, our customers lose lose revenue. We just need to make sure it always works. Uh, And that's what we're providing. That model of replicating each message three times on three different data centers 
Why do you have to do that? Why can't you just have one the message replicated just on you know a single time on each of those data centers? It's a consumer producer ratio, and our infrastructure and our use case, we see that we have a one to one hundred ratio of consumer producer. There's a lot of consumers reading data off that same topic or need that need that message. So what we've decided to do is proactively replicate that. It's cheaper and more economical for us to replicate that message proactively. Even even if someone else isn't going to be reading it in the other data center. So our costs are lower and our reliability is higher. It's kind of like a win-win. And you wouldn't think that, right? <laughs> Why don't you optimize it so that we don't send a message that no one's going to read? Turns out uh, that's just not how people use uh, publish subscribe systems. You're a successful developer, and you couldn't have gotten to where you are without help in your education and career. Maybe you're thinking about ways to give back in the community where you live. The Teals program is looking for engineers from across the country to volunteer to teach computer science in high schools. Work with a computer science teacher in the classroom to bring development concepts to life through teamwork and determination. Pay your success forward by volunteering with high school students in your area by encouraging them on the computer science path. You can make a difference. If you'd like to learn more about the Microsoft Teals program or submit your volunteer application, go to tealsk12.org slash sedaily. That's T-E-A-L-S-K-1-2.org slash sedaily. Thank you to the Teals program for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. I guess I'm still a little bit confused because I can understand why you would want it on each of the data centers, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering why you need it three times on each data center because you can imagine, okay, user A is going to send a message to uh, channel B or you or channel X yeah. and they send they send the message to channel X and it hits a server one of the servers one of the three servers that holds all the messages for channel X and then the message gets replicated three times on that server and then it gets sent to two other servers where it also gets replicated three times I guess I'm just confused why you wouldn't just keep the message one time on each of those data centers, and then if you lose the instance that's holding that message, you just get it from the other data centers. Ah, yes. It is. It's replicated three times per data center, and then, and of course, to every single data center after that. And we do that specifically for reliability. Now, if you look at the company Tibco and maybe other messaging bus companies, they offer what's called guaranteed messaging, a guaranteed delivery. They are able to achieve that uh, at least in their claims and on paper, by simply replicating a message twice. They replicate it twice. And that's what they saw, They call guaranteed message delivery. And we don't store those messages on disk. We store them only in memory. And this is a, this is a big reason why we want to do it at least one more time, right? Because mm, yeah. it's more volatile. Exactly. So you get enough failures in a single data center to justify having those extra replicas of each message. That's especially true. And there's one extra bonus. We have large events that come onto our network where they have high demand on reads or subscribes for that same topic. And we need to replicate that data in each of the TCP packets to every single IP address that's requesting it. And we need to be able to distribute that workload across our systems. And it, at times it can get spiky. And having that data proactively copied allows us to deliver on our SLAs of a quarter of a second. Because you, you want to replicate that data so that you have uh, more availability on the read side. You got it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So maybe you can just describe what happens when somebody subscribes or when somebody creates a channel when they start publishing messages to it and how the con consumption of a message happens. Like walk us through the you know just what happens on the infrastructure layer when that you know initial onboarding event happens all right so let's paint a picture here you've got a phone and you want to install a pubnub sdk onto it the developer will issue an api call within the sdk called a subscribe they're going to subscribe to channel a what that does is send a signal to our network before it does that it does one important thing it says which data center should i hit 
We use a DNS provider called Dyn. You may be familiar with them. They had a D-Day about October 20th, 21st, a uh, year or two ago. Most of the internet went down. <laughs> IoT devices. Yes, the Mirai. Yes, that's it. You got it. That is a powerful... Actually, Cisco acquired them, I believe. They power Twitter, Amazon.com. They power a ton of different companies, Cloudflare, Fastly, CDN companies, and ours as well. Uh, What we do is that device will do a a port 53 datagram asking for the nearest data center. It'll return IP addresses for the closest data center using Dyn's IP. It'll establish a socket to our network that lives forever, essentially. Our TCP uh, policy is unlimited. Um, so you have an always-on, long-lived connection to our network. You paste up uh, the channel data and the last message that you want to receive if, if you want all the data or just you know, let me know if there's new stuff coming forward. That'll jump through our edge. It jumps through some routing tables, and then it lets you hit a specific node that will hold a file descriptor open and says, okay, this file descriptor will get any information on this channel. Uh, so next we have another phone that shows up and it's going to be sending data. It uses the same mechanism of connectivity and then it will publish using the PubNub uh, publish API. That message hits our network, automatically uh, routes the replication layer, hits all of the subscribe nodes internally, and then that message comes back propagating down the original subscribe call. Got it. So by the way, I mean, your mention of Dyn may be curious. What <laughs> happened to your infrastructure when that, that Mirai DDoS by the way, for those who don't know, this was basically there were all these IoT devices throughout the world that had the same username and password default credentials, and there was a botnet that logged into all of those IoT devices that had those default credentials and started launching a DDoS attack against Dyn, which is core internet infrastructure, and so <laughs> the downstream effects was knock down Netflix, knock down... Yep. Twitter, mm-hmm. other victims. Did you have problems in that event? Yeah, so I was uh, I was in contact with Cloudflare and Fastly and everyone else who was running on it. They were saying all we can do is watch, watch the world burn. It was uh, wow. it was I was taking out my phone and I was Snapchatting all of the graphs as they were shooting straight downward in this precipitous drop slope. I'm like, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> Wait. We had we tried switching providers, and uh, you know by the time it came back around, you know it started coming back. So it takes a while to figure out that stuff. Uh, but uh, what were you about to ask? I was going to say, so at least we know Snapchat is not on Dyn, right? Exactly. <laughs> What's, yeah, it's Google infrastructure. They pay something of a uh, two hundred million dollars or so uh, annually to uh, Google for that. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Were you on AWS initially? Because I know this was like two years after AWS got started. I guess it, back then it was it was a, a pretty real decision. Do you go on the cloud or not? Ah, for me it was it was clear to go on the cloud immediately. Uh, I was just it was just obvious after you know having experience myself in data centers and you know having to go visit that colo and all oh, reboot the system or whatnot. It's just. Uh, it's something that you don't want to worry about when you're starting a business, especially in tech today. It's just, oh, yeah, press the button on Amazon. They'll take care of it for you. Even though they fail, they do, they fail, but they take care of the failures for you, which is nice. Indeed. So it was not much of a decision, but did you have any scalability issues in the early days when you were you know, onboarding all the, the customers early on and you just had your kind of in, your first version of your product? Scalability, Yes. Amazon wasn't able to handle our connectivity requirements. We had millions of devices connecting throughout their network, which, you know, had hammering on their firewalls and their network layer. We had to spin up additional data center capacity in what was called soft layer. IBM had acquired them and, you know, other other data center providers as well, uh, DigitalOcean. We were able to continue to scale into Amazon as they improved their infrastructure. You had to have these other providers is overflow capacity because like why couldn't you just overflow onto additional aws instances it was a core networking layer issue that they just couldn't handle with us uh, we'd see these massive you know one second global dropouts uh, for every connected device it's just that the way they had architected it was not set up for our type of connectivity it, it was mainly should should have mainly been rest api calls is what they were good for and not long-lived connections so that said why didn't you 
did you consider like going more heavily onto DigitalOcean or onto SoftLayer more aggressively early on? What what was it about AWS that made you continue to just over time shift your more and more infrastructure and less and less reliance on the other overflow providers? It's a, a purely a developer operations consideration. We have hmm. all the all the pieces we need. Our orchestration was spun around AWS APIs. It made it easier for us to launch new data center co-locations with them. It was just such, a, such an easy win. When Terraform, a HashiCorp technology, came out, uh, it was easy for us to hit not just Amazon, but any other of the providers that offered APIs to scale with them. And so that allowed us to diversify. Oh. Yeah, which is great. And Amazon still our number one data center provider of choice because our customers are there too. We want to be right next to your servers, which allows a millisecond of latency. If you're doing server-side publishing or if you're subscribing on a data stream, you should be able to receive that data uh, locally. Already talked about most of the the core application infrastructure of PubNub being written in C. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you are very comfortable building what you need to build. But was there stuff that you took off the shelf? Like what database, did you use some databases to, to store the messages? Or do you have your own in-memory thing that you built to store these messages? Databases, yes. We have our in-memory database is proprietary, which is uh, based on our, our replication and our patents. We do have a disk-backed database that we offer through our storage and playback service called Cassandra, perfect for time series publish subscribe events. And boy, did we have a ton of issues with that. (laughs) Well, you're not alone. I've I've heard that from from other people. Cassandra can be difficult. Oh, yeah. It was our fault. It was just a user. It's just like that Kafka thing that we were talking about earlier. You have to tune it specifically for the use case. And our customers are diverse. And we had, we had, we tuned it for general use case purposes. However, uh, it just didn't match. It didn't meet the requirements. And we mixed our tables around and uh, ultimately had a lot of downtime because of our, uh, our misuse of the system. Now we're good at it. We've got professionals on site and uh, we know exactly how to use it and how to scale it. So you said you, you basically wrote your own databases though, for that you wrote an, an in-memory database? Yes. It uh, allowed us to have zero... Uh, lock time on memory allocation and deallocation. We didn't have any garbage collection pauses or anything like that with our system. It allowed us to be very nimble. Most of the messages that we send and receive are under one kilobyte. And trying to tune memory profiles for that became challenging, especially when diversity of a larger message payloads and the frequency changed and over larger message channels. A lot of channels. So many data channels. My goodness. This (laughs) was... We really got a great performance out of our C and ability to sort of have a wheel or a clock tick sort of tick away at the message memory, which allowed us to maintain our memory profile without having ooms. We used to have ooms a lot, a lot of out of memories. Um, The kernel would just say, hey, this process is using too much memory. Boom, dead. It just kills it outright. And that database would just be empty. Uh, So it just took us a few years to make that work without crashing. Um, we've we've succeeded at that. and It's been running fine for years now. Did you write that uh, in memory database? Was that in the um, the first version of the product, no. or did you ha- did you use something else and build your own thing eventually? Uh, we prototyped the infrastructure on, uh, of course, Node.js back in the day. Node.js was just getting started, so it would, it would crash regularly, and it would have all sorts of fun challenges. Uh, as soon as uh, we started hitting, you know, scale and customers were knocking on our door, it's like, okay, we just can't keep sitting on the servers and terminal windows and, you know, keeping things up and running. We need to have some serious infrastructure. And then we just buckled down, wrote C using our globally distributed model. And that's the same code base. Of course, new iterations since then. So as time has gone on, you've gotten bigger and bigger customers are there instances where you have a particular customer who pushes the limits of the infrastructure and then you have to refactor the infrastructure because of that heavy customer? Good question. So it turns out it's a producer versus consumer problem. So if you've got a device or a server or something that's just massively publishing a lot of data per second down a data channel, that's fine. We like that. We're good at that. The challenge is the consumer on the mobile device or the laptop isn't able to keep up. It'll start falling behind. It just can't 
keep up. So what we've done is we built in an automatic pressure system, which will begin intentionally dropping data. It's just, hey, uh, you're pushing way too much data to this channel. And we're able to tune that on a per customer basis. And it's, it's automatic today. And if a customer has high volume needs, we either help them or architect it properly, or uh, we tune a little configuration flag, which propagates throughout the network within about a second. Hmm. Like when you have a new customer and they, you know, they really do push your, your system, you know, push the limits of it. Does, are there any adverse effects? Like, does it cause some, some downtime or does it automatically, does it automatically rebalance necessarily? Ah, good question. Uh, it's uh, automatically, it's the last, the last thing that you said, that's the right part. Okay. Yeah. It auto rebalances. Everything is, uh, you know, streamlined and smooth. There is a perception though. This is an important one that not all the data will get to the end target device. That's because you're hitting our throttling limits. If you're attempting to either load test or you know just push the limits on that, you're going to run into our intentionally coded uh, software limitations. And we just like, we stop you at a certain point. We're like, okay, there's no way that other device is going to be able to receive that much data. So we're going to begin dropping those messages. Ah, okay. Do you, do you drop them completely or do you, do you hold them in some like pressure queue or something on the live connection they're dropped if you have storage and playback enabled they're saved forever Mm, got it do you have any other interesting edge cases that you've encountered like difficult problems that you've had to solve as you've been building out the infrastructure over the last seven years we wanted to make it cheaper for us to operate and we were talking about this multi-threaded a specialized memory system that would give us 60% cost savings on paper. We started working on it. Sound promising. We got some initial good test results. A few months later, still same thing. Six months. All right, this is taking a long time. What's going on here? A year later. All right, let's see if we can get this thing into production. Constantly crashes. It's just so many, so many problems in a highly concurrent system like PubNub where we're currently doing 24, I'm looking at the dashboard, 24 million transactions per minute, that building a threaded system, just it just is too difficult architecturally. We have really smart people here, like low level network. They know what they're doing. Just the challenge comes in with such a high volume of data and moving it around, having multiple threads, all accessing same memory addresses, just creates these uncertainties. It's, it's just didn't work. Uh, uh, So we had to choose to throw away that year's worth of investment. Yeah, it's, it was unfortunate. And the promise, it feels like, it feels like it's possible. It's still there. It's just too much, too much code, too much complexity for us to be operating. It sounds like, you know, when Amazon built the Fire Phone and they just like had to throw it out (laughs) eventually. (laughs) But, but I think they got some value out of it. I think there were some learnings from that, for example, that like maybe carried over into the, the Amazon Echo. Hmm. Were there learnings that you took away from that experience that made it worth it? Or are you just like, uh, that was really not worth it and terrible waste of time? It's always, you always learn something when, when you fail, right? If you don't, then what's going on here? You know how I mentioned that we had a policy of like sort of no backup systems. Every system should always be hot and running to service the customer and expect failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have another one. Uh, the other one is no threads, and it's not that we w- we knew that it was going to be a failure because it seems feasible. It's just the level of complexity that's introduced in such a highly concurrent system, and it just reminded us, you know, to keep true to our our ways and just you know keep things simple. In engineering, you always want to reduce code. Code reduction is like bliss for development. And it's like, ah, we got rid of this. We don't need to maintain or own that piece of code anymore. And it, from an engineering perspective, it's, it's just happiness and comfort. So you should always go towards code reduction and stray away from, you know, bloating your code base by trying to reduce costs. Users have come to expect real time. They crave alerts that their payment is received. They crave little cars zooming around on the map. They crave locking their doors at home when they're not at home. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to making your app real-time. 
PubNub makes it simple, enabling you to build immersive and interactive experiences on the web, on mobile phones, embedded into hardware, and any other device connected to the internet. With powerful APIs and a robust global infrastructure, you can stream geolocation data, you can send chat messages, you can turn on sprinklers, or you can rock your baby's crib when they start crying. PubNub literally powers IoT cribs. 70 SDKs for web, mobile, IoT, and more means that you can start streaming data in real time without a ton of compatibility headaches. And no need to build your own SDKs from scratch. And lastly, PubNub includes a ton of other real-time features beyond real-time messaging, like presence for online or offline detection, and access manager to thwart trolls and hackers. Go to pubnub.com slash sedaily to get started. They offer a generous sandbox tier that's free forever until your app takes off, that is. pubnub.com slash sedaily, that's p-u-b-n-u-b dot com slash sedaily. Thank you, PubNub, for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. What are the kinds of ca- applications? Because I, I think that's actually a pretty good lesson. Uh, and I think there's actually, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, what are the cases where if you're somebody out there running a software company where you should pause and refactor your infrastructure to make it cheaper to run? Because it seems like, in general, software is a high-margin business, and you generally don't have to do that so much. You generally don't have to refactor for cost. But, for example, I, like I heard a, you know, a story about WP Engine recently. WP Engine you know, r- basically runs WordPress, mm-hmm. just runs WordPress uh, you know, instances for people, mm-hmm. and they moved to Kubernetes and it gave them some giant cost reductions. Ah. Um, but actually, e- even then, I think, think they saved like 50% of their costs by moving to Kubernetes, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. But you know, I think the, the main reason for they, they moved to Kubernetes was actually for operational reasons, and the costs were just additional benefits. But I don't know, do you have any principles for when people should migrate infrastructure because of cost management? The modern way to move forward with hosting and deploying and operations is these containerized management systems, such as Kubernetes. We're doing this too. We're migrating all of our orchestration software, which we originally wrote in Python scripts and in Perl scripts to you know manage how each of the nodes are interconnecting with each other. And Kubernetes sort of just takes care of all that for you. It makes it so much easier. Your your cost on on manpower goes down. We've noticed that we don't have to deal with certain things anymore. It's uh, we have half of our infrastructure on it now, especially when you have many different compute patterns. They're not homogeneous, right? They're, they're essentially this, you've got one kind of process that takes up a lot of RAM. This other one is very CPU hungry. This one uses a lot of network. What you get to do with Kubernetes is sort of shove all those different, you know, compute patterns into a single box so you can leverage what you're paying for. Like you're paying for this EC2 box that has all these capabilities, 10 gig network, you know, a bunch of gigs of RAM, a little bit of disk, you know, some CPU. And our current workload profile for some of our systems only uses one of those things. And then the bottleneck is hit. You don't want to have to code to like your application to use all those things if it can't, because just how it, it works. If you could instead just throw other workloads at it to, via Kubernetes, it knows how to s- distribute that and give you the best bang for your buck. And we we found it gave us the same thing you're describing, fantastic cost savings. You've been managing this company now for about eight years. Mm. <laughs> How has the management role evolved over time as the company has changed? So you probably, you know, there's this uh, Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z, they always talk about the different phases of a startup's life cycle. You know, it just changes. It's the way intercommunication happens, the way agile works, you need to get more streamlined. It's just as we grow and teams expand and need to have their own initiatives, it's Communication is just totally different now. Every company's solution is a meeting. Oh, let's just have a meeting for that. After a while, you just try to keep solving with meeting after meeting, and then you have that, you know, let's have a meeting about meetings. <laughs> I mean, and it just becomes this horrible experience. Oh, yeah. We have, especially in the engineering team, you, you want them to say, we need more meetings. 
you don't want to be in the place where oh, we're just sitting in meetings all the time. We're not getting anything done. Of course, we still talk about it. We still say, hey, you know, we're not we're not optimal on our time when we're meeting together. A lot of people are, you know, just on their laptops, like not paying attention. So how do you solve that? I mean, that's a challenge. What have you heard from other other businesses? How do they solve that meeting challenge? The first thing that comes to mind is I had a conversation with somebody from Box recently, and he was talking about something similar to this. But it sounded like the way to solve communication from his point of view was, first of all, you you do unfortunately have to build layers of management hierarchy. Mm-hmm. It's just a necessity. Uh, we, you know, we could talk all about holacracy or like totally flat organizations, but in general, you're going to solve this with hierarchy. Mm-hmm. But then you push decisions to the bottom of the hierarchy as aggressively as you can. You let the people who are actually implementing things make the decisions mm-hmm. as much as possible. And and you just set a strategy. The people who are anywhere above the bottom layer are just sort of setting strategy and letting people operate autonomously as much as possible. And I'm sure that's not always possible. I'm sure that, you know, you on, on certain circumstances, you have to be a little more micromanagerial. But I feel like that's been a theme that I've heard, this like sort of decentralized, you know, pushing decisions out to the edges of the organization. Absolutely. We, we subscribe to that as well. That's critically important. You don't want to be, it's kind of hard though. Sometimes you like, you want to be there because you think you know what is right and what makes sense. However, that's not where the value is. The value is in, in your team and, and in, the, in the company itself. That team needs to be self-sufficient and move forward. And big, important topic is ownership. If they can't own something that they haven't decided on, it's motivational. If they're able to say, hey, I bet my job that this is the best way that we can go, they're going to ensure that that you know, is carried forward. And that sort of motivation is hard to get if you're barking orders, right? <laughs> So have you had to do anything interesting to to keep those communications running smoothly as that headcount has increased? Have you had to develop additional management layers or any kind of particular practices that you've codified? Uh, we've we tried to, you know, be inventive and do things our way. And we started to notice just this is a solved problem. If you look at larger organizations and their structures, it sounds bureaucratic and boring. It turns out it's that way because it kind of works. You need to have uh, the team that you're describing. Uh, you need to have that upper layer of management that's able to enable their teams and their departments to be successful and push them forward in, in being motivated. It's really that simple. Uh, you can't be too inventive with this. Might as well just use what works. So are you referring to, uh, also to things like key performance indicators and I guess SLAs and all, any other acronyms that <laughs> you know you put in place or it just are there books that you've read that uh, outline particular management philosophies that have been useful at PubNub? So we've tried doing some of those things. We've tried doing OKRs, which we currently are. We're doing the Google style OKRs. Uh, it's been rough. Most team members say, hey, you know, if we're If we're listing out all of these objectives over the quarter and the goal is to only get 70%, why is it only 70%? Why why can't it just be 100%? It's... uh it didn't make any sense. And so, you know, of course, we're still struggling with some of that. And now we drive all of our teams and all of our business on something that's measurable. It has to be uh, measurable in a way it's like, okay, our uptime needs to be five nines. Um, And if we drop, then we know that we didn't meet our objective and we need to give credits to our customers. Uh, Our inbound leads need to be X number of signups per month. Uh, We need to keep pushing and growing that. That number needs to keep going up. And being a marketing or a metrics-driven organization helps a lot from uh, a managerial perspective. And from a team perspective, how do you know when you're being successful? How do you know uh, in this in this day and age where numbers are really big and unimaginable, like even at the number one million, it's just like one or two off from that is non It's like just not meaningful. Uh, So if you're able to see larger trends over longer periods of time and measure that, you can see trends. It's like stocks, right? Stock, easy numbers. You see when the Dow Jones goes up or Dow Jones goes down. We need the same thing for running the business. And it just makes it easy for us to celebrate when we, and then when we lose, we just figure out how to do it better. Do you have an SRE facet to your organization or some other kind of basically how do you do incident response and on call and monitoring and logging the those philosophies that get that 
you know, generally get bucketed under the site reliability engineering role? Uh, pager duty. <laughs> That's an easy, yes. an easy one to answer. Uh, yeah, we have uh, site re- reliability engineers in each team, multiple teams here at PubNum. The, the teams are responsible for their pieces of the infrastructure and they share a pager. Now, the cool part about most of our infrastructure uh, is it's automated and will self-heal. Even if Amazon goes down, uh, our SDKs that are installed on mobile phones will connect to the next closest data center. So for the most part, there's not a whole lot of operations. And if, you know, when stuff goes wrong, just it's self-healing and customers don't even notice, which has been pretty fantastic for us. And so what about monitoring and logging? Ah, yes. So that's very expensive for us. It's uh, about three petabytes of messages, JSON messages, traverses our network every month. And we used to save all that data uh, it became really expensive. And then we turned on this, we were saving into Amazon S3. Then we turned on this thing called Glacier and it saved us a little bit of money. It's just kept growing and growing. Now it's uh, it's just too expensive for us to save that. So we actually just dropped the data and it, it just goes away, which makes me so sad. There's these like TensorFlow and artificial intelligent machine learning things. We've got data here that is extremely valuable. We could drive information from it, some sort of meaning, but we're throwing it away. <laughs> we have to though it's just too expensive to keep it all wow one managerial challenge that i thought might exist with this company um when i was just like kind of looking at the the nature of your company was you've got you've got a lot of apis and you you have uh you also have deals with ap other api companies like you have these abstractions that you've built on companies like cloudinary and clarify and then you've you you have to build a lot of SDKs. So like you have SDKs for for web and then mobile phones and IoT devices. And if I think about the matrix of all of the different customers, it's it's a lot of surface area of different ways that people can use the products together. And I wonder if it, does the surface area of all those different use cases ever become hard to manage, or do you have any systems that you have in place that make it easier to manage those? Yes, the age-old platform support question, which platforms do you support, and how expensive is it? It's uh, very expensive for us to support these mainstream platforms. We have teams that have expertise in each of these. It's, it's uh, important for us to make our customer successful using techniques in each of the platforms that allow extreme reliability. We have to build in that automatic data center switch over into each of the SDKs. And it, each SDK needs to know what messages is received and which ones it needs to fetch next. Uh, so yes, you're right. That's, that's just a massive footprint. However, how else would you do business if you need to make it easy for everyone? Um, yeah, it's just no other way to do it. Definitely. Do you have like testing mechanisms in place or does it just remain pretty consistent across the, when you build a, when you have to build a new SDK for web and mobile and IOT, like you have a new, you know, you build these new services, for example, this, the, the chat, the new chat engine service that you built, if you wanted to have an SDK for the web and the mobile and the IOT devices that all interfaced with this chat engine, would you try to write tests that that work on all three of those SDKs? Or would you write specific tests for each of those SDKs? Like, what are your principles around testing the different places where people can be using those APIs? All right. So e- a quick, easy answer. We have a book or a, piece, a Google Doc. The Google Doc says every SDK must hit these criteria and have these tests implemented. So it's, it's really simple. We have to just follow that rule and make sure that, you know, it subscribes mm. to channel A. Uh, it, it has this... Acceptance test. Yeah, exactly. Acceptance test. And they must be runnable continuously in a CICD framework. So we have uh, Travis, for example. It continuously runs connectivity tests across all of our SDKs, including long-lived tests and short-lived quick tests to make sure that the data is what it needs to be. We have a subscribe API. However, it's really complicated based on all the different capabilities that API can ask for an expression to filter out certain messages via our server. It can ask for a channel group subscription, which can receive a 
a variable and changing amount of data based on what's in that channel group. So there's there's a lot of tests and a lot of variances that come. I believe it's around 200 and some tests that must be implemented for each SDK. Fascinating. So, you know, as we talked at the beginning, the the core use case that you built everything else off of was this data stream network that allows people to have pub sub channels. So it's just the basic idea of pub sub is so generally applicable that you can actually build a lot of other products on top of that. So how do you think about the product expansion? How have you thought about what products to build on top of that core pub sub infrastructure? Ah, it's a uh, customer driven. So our customer asks us, okay, we've got this cool public subscribe API. The data gets to the mobile phone and you know, it works. We're happy with it. It would be great if we could tell if, is that phone still online? Did it go offline? How can we tell when this happened? So we built a TCP layer infrastructure that allowed us to detect the connectivity of that device uh, best as we can, of course. And we call that PubNet presence. And they asked us, wow, I'm sending all these messages to you and I don't have any way to retrieve them later. How can I do that? So we built storage and playback, which is that Cassandra thing I was telling about earlier. Then our customers asked us about these weird, crazy requests. I need to be able to count this number and update a badge number here and blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, how do, how do we actually turn that into a product? That's a, what the heck do we do? We couldn't consolidate all the customer requests into a single, you know, next phase product. So you've heard this fra- uh, serverless phrase, right? Serverless, oh, it's all these. Yeah. We had to build a way for our customers small bits of logic, a couple lines of JavaScript into our network to tune or follow their business rules on that data stream, on that data feed, either to you know augment the message, block the message because of content, uh, insert additional content uh, using HTTP REST calls to other services. PubNub Functions is the product we built to support that. And those functions, when you deploy a line of JavaScript with like a single if statement in it that just says, if there's the word Coca-Cola in this message, then block it. That code is distributed to every single one of our data centers. And anytime a message is published to one of those data centers, that code is run locally at that data center. This whole serverless trend, you know, you got a lot of, there's a lot of different companies that are building this functionality into their their products, like I've talked to to Cloudflare, of course mm-hmm. Amazon, and then Auth0. Mm-hmm. How do you think behind this trend of people increasingly building in this serverless functionality that allows the customers to write code into the the higher level APIs that you know you, you wouldn't have expected customers to to want this kind of thing in the past. Ah, right. It's just one of those things that rolled over and the trend kept happening. You know, if there wasn't a concept called serverless, we would still want to go down this path that we went down. Being able to give your customer the control of how the network is involved and shaped is very important, especially since you need somewhere to host your trusted code. You want that code to execute in a trusted environment, not on a client mobile device which is untrusted code execution because those things are hackable and crackable. You want it uh, to store your business logic in a place that just can't be tampered with. So typically our customers would spin up their own servers. They would just be like, okay, let's spin up a Ruby server or a Node.js server and then put our logic there. And it would have to sort of do this ping pong hop, which introduced latency and a single point of failure. So we decided, oh, we can't have our customers keep using this broken design pattern, especially since our network is globally distributed and and they're basing it off of this one process that they have hosted in a data center that could just fail and their entire product fails. And it looks like PubNum is broken at that point. So we had to build a globally distributed system that automatically updates any of the JavaScript code that you want to push to us, even if it's a small one-line if statement or a a full-blown, you know, node app. Fascinating. And so what are some of the other APIs that you've built on top of this core networking stack? Because I know it's you know, you, like you've got that chat engine thing that lets people build chat systems more easily, you know, just like a host of other higher level products that you've built. So yeah. what are some of the other ones that you've built on top of this? We have a visualization framework called Eon, and it gives you uh, you know charts and graphs and gauges that move in real time that uses D3 
uh, to animate on your web browser. It's great for creating dashboards or visualizing the data stream on PubNub. We have a WebRTC SDK that allows you to connect between two IP addresses to establish a peer-to-peer connection. Those types of products that we built are a, sort of like opinionated frameworks. Because with PubNub, you can use any sort of channel topology that you want. You can create channel A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you can also do A dot star, and you can have channel groups to have a list of channels that are being subscribed by the device. It's really powerful, all the capabilities and features you have. However, it's easy to make a mistake in your channel topology decision. So what we did was we saw our customers wanted to implement chat. They wanted to implement a dashboard. What we did was create an opinionated framework that follows pretty much all the designs that are required for those systems and implement it in a way that a customer would be able to adopt off the shelf really quick. Steve, it's been great talking to you. I just I want to wrap up by just talking a little bit about the future. So what are the the future products that you're thinking about and the improvements to the core infrastructure that you're focused on? So we talk about real time and that, you know, of course, real time would be like instantaneous, like perfect, like boom, it happened. However, you know, our universe is currently held back by the laws of physics and the speed of light is the fastest that you can go. I would like, I've done research on how to do this sort of quantum entanglement where it's like spooky action at a distance quoted from Albert Einstein. Is there a way that we can have true real-time communication? Uh, of course, I'm talking a little bit of sci-fi here, but that that would be pretty darn sweet for us to come up with that solution. However, after doing some research, it turns out the current quantum entanglement principles are not used for communication. They're used for cryptographic capabilities. Essentially, you can entangle two atoms, two particles. They're essentially spinning at the same like axis as now. You can then encapsulate those in like boxes and then move those boxes far apart. Then you can ask or you could probe that particle with a, you know, a question. What's your current integer value? Probing one of them and then the other one at the distance will give you the same identical integer value, which is great for shared secrets, right? And then every iteration after that, of course, it decays after a while. Uh, However, that's what quantum entanglement currently is. I want it to be the real-time communication, though. It's not that. So if we're going to talk about some real world stuff here, you know how we built, <laughs> yeah, we built that. <laughs> no, let's talk, let's, let's talk more about fanciful, fanciful. <laughs> real time communication problem, know, problems right? and solutions. That's, that's really where the, the cool stuff is. We are building like chat engine where it was a pinned framework for chat to make that really quick and easy, uh, which panned out and made it really easy for our customers to get live quicker, which brings us revenue faster and brings our customers to market more quickly. We're going to do that with IOT as well. We have customers. Customers like Logitech uh, and Samsung and Wink and Vivint, they have IoT devices such as a smart fridge and a, you know, a home automation kit where you can turn on and off your light bulb from your office, right? So it's really easy for you to do those things uh, with PubNum. We're going to create IoT framework. I don't know what it's going to be called yet. IoT engine, who knows? Uh, We've got to do the same thing with video games. Gaming is even more difficult because you have latency mitigation strategies that you need to implement to give the player a good experience. Uh, We have to implement and build those. Specifically for Unity is our our target. It's funny because IoT is one of these things where it's just like every year we must be getting closer to that bright IoT future. Mm -hmm. But you could look, you know, 10 years ago and people were building IoT devices and IoT frameworks and stuff, and you know, it, 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 unfortunately, that you know, we don't we don't have widespread adoption of of internet connected fridges and internet connected light bulbs and so right. on. But at the same time, we know that it's coming. <laughs> it is that's the kind of stuff is going to come eventually. It's just it's one of those things where you have n- no idea when it's actually going to come. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's uh, we're living the world now. It's it's happening. Yeah. Well, anyway, Stephen, thanks for coming on the show. It's been great talking to you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here today. Thank you, Jeff. We are running an experiment to find out if Software Engineering Daily listeners are above average engineers. At triplebyte.com slash SE Daily, you can take a quiz to help us gather data. I took the quiz and it covered a wide range of topics. General programming ability, a little security, a little system design. It was a nice short test to measure how my practical engineering skills have changed since I started this podcast. I will admit, although I've gotten better at talking about software engineering, 
I have definitely gotten worse at actually writing code and doing software engineering myself. But if you want to check out that quiz yourself and help us gather data, you can take that quiz at triplebyte.com slash SE Daily. And in a few weeks, we're going to take a look at the results and we're going to find out if SE Daily listeners are above average. And if you're looking for a job, Triple Byte is a great place to start your search, fast tracking you at hundreds of top tech companies. Triple Byte takes engineers seriously and does not waste their time. I recommend checking it out at triplebyte.com slash SE Daily. That's triple B Y T E dot com slash SE Daily. Thank you, Triple Byte, for being a sponsor. Wow. 